Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm sorry for the delay and uh, thank you for your patience. My name is Mark Berthold. I'm the head of the division for the European Union and North America of the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin. I really welcome you all uh, to, to this event tonight. We're really happy that you joined us from wherever you are. We know that you are sitting in many very different places in Europe. This is amazing because Europe is going to be one of the topics tonight. This is the beginning of a series of events that we are having in cooperation with the Foundation Women in Europe, Stiftung Frauen in Europa, who has a goal to kind of like work and to support the position of women in civil society in the process of European unity and also of European integration. So this is why the, European, uh, the Stiftung Women in Europe um, has also um, is working on diverse uh, ways of life the role of women in, in an ever-growing Europe, and to also uh, put emphasis on the work and their role of women in cultural and uh, gender equality issues all across Europe. Together, the Heinrich Böll Foundation and the Foundation Women in Europe, this next year, want to begin to um, give a position, to give the voice, to tell the story of women in all their aspects of lives and work in Europe, because they are like leading women leaders doing this to support democracy, gender equality, diversity, and participation in politics, in society, but also in the economy and in culture. And our goal together in partnership is with this series of events that we're starting tonight to tell their stories, to highlight their achievements, but also to bring them together to make them stronger together, to make Europe more uh, equal for in women's rights, in gender diversity, in intersectional participation. And that's why I'm really happy that for tonight we have, we have a first look at the feminist struggle and feminist fight for reproductive rights from three perspectives of three different countries in Europe, from Poland, from Ireland and the Netherlands, that we have a chance to look at it closer to listen to the struggles and to the challenges, but also to learn from each other. So this is the goal for tonight. And I really would like to thank uh, the Foundation Women in Europe for their support and for their cooperation. And I'm really thrilled and really excited to um, introduce and to welcome our three speakers, as Bieta Korolczuk from Poland, Orla Okana from Ireland, and Rebecca Gompels from the Netherlands. And I'm also really grateful to our Francesca Brandner, a member of the German Bundestag for the German Green Party, to uh, chair this discussion tonight. She will take over in less than a minute. She also had, uh, was one of those who had the idea for this series of events. So I'm really proud that she is part of uh, tonight from the very beginning. And before I hand over, I would like to thank also my colleagues, Sabine Hemmerling, Ulrike Sichon in Berlin, but also Joanna Stolarek and Anna Jakubowska in our office in Warsaw, who helped organize this event and are behind the scenes in carrying it through tonight. I would like to thank our technicians and the translation, our translators. Uh, this event is being translated into Polish and into German and English. For the Polish language, for technical reasons, you have to choose the Spanish channel. But if you do that, you'll hear it in the Polish language, uh, trust us. And so I'm really happy. I won't take any further time because this is a discussion from Francesca Brandner with Elzbieta Kowalczuk, Orla O'Connor and Rebecca Gompertz. And Francesca, the floor is yours. Thank you all very much. Thank you for those technical uh, advice. Uh, I would like to introduce our speakers uh, briefly and uh, just to highlight that I think it is so exciting to have the three of you from three different countries struggling on the same issue, the reproductive rights of women and girls in Europe and worldwide. Um, Dr. Elzbieta Korolczuk, uh, she is a sociologist, cultural scientist, women and human rights activist. She works at the Södertörn University in Stockholm, but teaches also gender studies at the University of Warsaw. She discusses in her research issues of gender, social movements and civil society. She has authored numerous books and she is also an honorary member of the Association for Our Children and a member of the board of the Foundation Action Democracy. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Orla O'Connor from Ireland 
is co-director at Together for Yes. They campaigned successfully for a yes vote in the 2018 referendum to ratify the 36th Amendment, which removed the constitutional ban on abortion in Ireland. Uh, and she was named in recognition of that success, one of the time 100 most influential people alongside the other co-directors of Together for Yes. She is the leading Irish women membership organization called the National Women's Council of Ireland. It has 180 member groups. And she has worked in senior management in NGOs for over 25 years. She has led many campaigns. So I'm very honored to have you with us tonight. Ola, thanks for joining. And last but not least, Rebecca Gombertz. Uh, you were uh, born in Suriname and you have studied visual arts and medicine in the, in the Netherlands. You are the founder on, of Women on Waves, Women on Web, and both provide reproductive health services for women in countries where it is not provided. You were included in 2013 and 14 in the BBC's 100 women list. And in 2020, you were named as one of the Time Magazine's 100 most influential people. You're a trained abortion specialist, activist, and author. Um, and I'm very happy to have you part of, as part of this discussion tonight. We will go a few rounds on the podium and then I'm happy to take your questions and your comments um, from the floor. You can write them uh, to us and I'm happy to take them up later on. I would also acknowledge and welcome Nora Sash, who has um, received the Anne Klein Prize in 2019 together with Christina Hanel and uh, Natasha Niklaus for her work um, on abortion and sexual and reproductive rights. So thanks for being with us tonight, Nora. It's great having you among us. So to start this debate off, I would like to ask the three of you to briefly tell us what is the current fight you are fighting uh, and what is the current struggle that is at the top of your agenda? Um, I guess, Elspieta, yours is most obvious, but it's also the most acute and the most inspiring these days to see uh, what is happening in Poland. So maybe you want to start and we go to Rebecca and Ola. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and the possibility to take part in this discussion. As you are probably all aware, in Poland there is a, um, well, the, the question of reproductive rights and justice has become one of the major political cleavages and struggles uh, today. And um, of course, uh, the issue of abortion has been um, an issue uh, which uh, led to social mobilization since the 90s, when in 1993, the current abortion law has been introduced, which basically bans abortion um, unless uh, there is a threat to women's uh, health and uh, life, uh, there is a malformation in the fetus or, um, or the pregnancy is the result of rape or incest. And since uh, 2015, when the current government um, of law and justice came to power, this struggles has become much more prevalent, much more intense, I would say, because uh, partly because of the fact that the current government is, uh, well, socially conservative or gender conservative, but also because ultra conservative organizations and groups, which often act in uh, collaboration, in cooperation with uh, transnational organizations, um, both from um, US uh, and also from other countries, have uh, become much more um, powerful and influential. They have gained resources and they have gained un access to um, state. Um, well, policymaking process basically and state institutions. So in that sense, um, what is happening in Poland right now, the struggles around abortion, about LGBT LGBTQ issues, about the rights of uh, minorities is very much part and parcel of what is happening in other countries because we see uh, opposition to gender equality and sexual democracy uh, not only in countries such as Poland or Hungary, but also in Germany, France, uh, and even Sweden, which is um, very often overlooked as a place where those ultra conservative organizations and forces try to have as much influence as possible. So in Poland now, uh, as you probably know, in October, the um, Constitutional Tribunal 
um, has issued a ruling uh, that uh, the uh, one exception, which was the most uh, widely used to gain, gain access to legal abortion, which was the malformation in the fetus, has been revoked or deemed unconstitutional. Constitutional. The problem is, of course, that the current Const constitutional tribunal is has been um, um, has been um, um, well. It's basically illegal to to make the long story story short. So the the judges who made this decision are not legally appointed to to these positions. But also the um, partly. I think due to the fact that this decision has uh, was met with a huge mobilization of, of Polish women and men, this decision has not been yet issued or publicized. So it's not yet in, um, in practice, at least legally speaking. So it's uh, from the legal point of view, uh, it's a huge mess basically. Uh, but if you look at the reaction of the Polish civil society, you can see a huge mobilization. Um, we have witnessed uh, in October and, and in um, November, the biggest dem street demonstrations since 1989. Uh, over 400,000 people went on the streets on the 30th of October. Uh, we also see a huge mobilization, especially of young people. And um, this is uh, something that I would like to stress that the pro-choice position has become over over the last couple of years, mostly due to the efforts of various um, feminist organizations and women's networks, a majoritarian position. Because what has happened in the 90s and early 2000s was that um, the, um, um, the, the percentage of Polish people who supported um, abortion on demand was usually around 20, 30%. And what has changed during the last couple of years is the fact that the majority, 52% of polls in a recent research project um, declared that abortion should be, should be um, available for women who need abortion, right? So in that sense, this position has become a majoritarian position, which is a huge change. And also what is important is that over 70% of Polish people declared that they support the process protests and 30% um, of people said, declared that they took, per, took part in, um, in street, street protests. So this is a huge change, which as yet has not uh, resulted in political change because obviously the Law and Justice Coalition uh, has um, a majority in the Polish parliament, has control over a judiciary to a large extent and has also a president that supports basically all the propositions that they are making. But at the same time, you can see this growing chasm or alienation of the ultra conservative um, um, government and organizations who try to implement such changes and the view and opinions of the majority of the Polish people. So these two issues, this majoritarian, uh, this pro-choice position as a majoritarian position and also the growing alienation of the forces who wants to implement ultra conservative uh, laws and ultra conservative regulations uh, are the two things that I, I think we should really observe with hope. Thank you. Thank you, Elspieta, for that input. input. Rebecca, what is your current fight that you're fighting? Sorry. Thank you so much. Um, so the um, what we have seen is that, um, so we have been uh, working in this field for over 20 years now uh, as women on waves and as women on web uh, and so um, if I uh, and, and what we've seen is, a, is, is many changes uh, in the past years of course uh, Ireland legalized abortion the Isle of Man legalized abortion um, but the the biggest challenge that we, we that we started seeing is that even in the countries that uh, think that they have a progressive abortion law or where abortion is, uh, is, is legalized uh, under certain conditions or only in certain circumstances, like in, or only available in clinics, that, may, that there's a lot of women that don't have access to these services. So we have been researching this since the last few years. Uh, we looked at the Netherlands uh, and Germany um, and we are now looking at France and, uh, and we looked at Italy and Hungary, where uh, women have the legal right to have an abortion, but um, especially for the most vulnerable women, uh, it's actually not accessible. And this can be uh, because of the cost, 
Uh, many uh, in many countries in Europe, like in Germany and in Austria, women still have to pay for their abortions. And when you are a low income woman, 500 euros is an extremely a lot of money. And so it's a huge social injustice that is being done he here. Um, or women that are living in situations uh, of um, domestic violence uh, where they cannot go to go to a clinic, travel, or they live in rural areas uh, where they have to, uh, to, to travel to urban areas, to a city, which can sometimes be two or three hours. So, for example, if we look at the German data, uh, over a thousand women has appro have approached us in 2019 in only a year uh, requesting for help. Um, and so, and, and Italy, the number is even higher. And if you look at Hungary, and that doesn't sound like a lot of people, but it's 1% of the, of the abortion uh, that are, are registered, uh, for example, in Germany. And I think that if we are a, a society that really cares about uh, equality and about social justice in women, then it's, it's, uh, it's not acceptable that the most vulnerable women in society are facing such huge obstacles uh, to access uh, abortion care. Uh, so what, um, uh, what, what, I, what we think has to happen now is that even in the countries that like Germany, like Italy, like the Netherlands, Belgium, um, they have to start moving forwards. And the interesting thing is that COVID has done this for some countries. So for example, in the UK, in England, telemedical abortion services are a standard form of care now. Um, and what they've seen is that it re results in uh, the abortions taking place earlier instead of later because of the obstacles of women to have to travel, to find childcare, etc. And so, uh, and that they're actually more effective and just more safe. Um, and so we have to keep up. All the countries have to evaluate their laws, take it out of the criminal code. A medical procedure like abortion has no place in a criminal code in any, in any democratic self-respecting country, uh, whether it's uh, democratic, uh, whether it's uh, the criminal code, uh, like it is in the Netherlands where doctors can actually go to jail for four years if they are not um, complying uh, with the regulations in the abortion law. Um, and a normal medical procedure should be should be regulated on a, you know, by any uh, primary healthcare uh, center should be able to provide the abortion pills and to prescribe it. Uh, and that is in accordance of the scientific advice uh, and policies of the World Health Organization. So that is what we are trying to do now to create uh, awareness about the obstacles of abortion care, even in the countries that say that there is not a problem, uh, and to, to hopefully this will be used to overturn archaic laws that are not anymore in, in line with the current scientific and human rights uh, principles uh, that are, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Very interesting also what you said about COVID and how it impacted um, the situation. Maybe we can go back into more detail on this later. Yes. Uh, but Ola, what is the current struggle that you are in these days? What are you, is the fight that you are fighting? Thank you, Francesca. And, and thanks to the Heinrich Boll Foundation and the Women York Foundation for, for inviting me. I think it's really important that we have these discussions um, in terms of how we're advancing reproductive rights in Europe. And also, I think, looking at the country experiences. I mean, for us in Ireland, we're now um, two, two years into the legislation uh, where women can access abortion. Um, and, and I think there's a few things in terms of where I suppose our activism is focused, you know, so it was such an enormous thing to have the constitutional ban on abortion to be removed. Um, but the legislation we have, it doesn't, it, it, it certainly doesn't allow for, for full access to abortion. So what we have in Ireland is um, we have a 12 week period where a woman doesn't have to give any reason. Um, but after that 12 week period, it is for um, health reasons, um, also then for fatal fetal anomalies, and then in terms of risk to life. So um, one of the things about the, the provision in Ireland is that 
um, we don't have countrywide provision. So, I mean, Ireland is a small country, um, but it's predominantly provision in urban areas and there hasn't been a full rollout. So for women living in more rural areas, they're still having to travel within Ireland and that causes barriers. Um, so some of the hospitals and some of the um, general practice, you know, primary care, they're, they're they're not yet providing it. Some of it is about conscientious objections, you know, some is about refusing to do it. Um, so that's a real issue. Um, and what we are coming into, and this is probably where most of the activism is focused now, from 21, there will be a review of the legislation. So what we're doing is we're working again collectively, the women's organizations, um, also some of the service providers um, and, and um, you know, I suppose a wide range of organizations have come together with the National Women's Council to look at how we can prepare ourselves for that review so that we really can look at um, widening the access. I think one of the things that is interesting in terms of where we're currently at is that as a result of COVID, before COVID, we were seeing protests outside some of the National Maternity Hospitals and, of, and, and we were, I suppose, looking at strategies to prevent that, for example, safety zones, uh, that, that obviously isn't happening because there isn't, you know, there's no opportunity for those type of protests. Um, so we don't know will that change when the restrictions are lifted. But the other thing which has been a positive impact actually of, of COVID is that there's now more remote access and telemedicine so that women are not having to go through the two appointments with their GP. They only have to be physically there for one. So that sort of you know, ties in with some of the things that Rebecca has said in terms of that whole sort of barriers to access. But what we're doing as activists is trying to campaign to maintain that. We don't want to lose that. When, um, when restrictions around COVID are lifted in Ireland. So there's a number of different fronts at the moment yeah, that, that we are campaigning on. Very interesting, thank you. Um, before I ask the second question to this round, I would like to welcome everybody to ask a question in the Q&A section. So, you know, scroll down and then you can write a question if you have one. Uh, but Ola, um, if I can start with you the second round, what do you think are successful strategies in the fight for women's reproductive uh, rights. Uh, I know that you, before the referendum, you had an internal sort of citizens council mm. working for a year. And um, yeah, I would be interested to hear what do you think were the successful strategies? Maybe also what didn't work? Uh, and uh, what are you trying to find out these days? What yeah. works or what doesn't? Yeah, and I mean, I think, yeah, like we've had a lot of reflection um, across feminist organizations and, um, you know, abortion rights organizations in relation to, you know, to the whole campaign in terms of what worked and, and, and what maybe, you know, would you do differently? And I mean, I think some of the, some of the important strategies for us were building a wide coalition across um, both civil society, but also, um, you know, across sectors of our society, such as the medical profession, um, which were a real key, you know, I suppose, key component um, of the campaign, because we learned very quickly through research that Irish people, you know, they wanted to hear and, and they trusted what the medical professions have to say. So that, so, so that, you know, that's important learning and it's important learning for now. Um, but so also, and I think this, this, this was a really, you know, I think difficult bit for, for feminist organizations, but it was the power of women telling their stories and experiences in Ireland that made an enormous difference. But, but I also think that that's really difficult, you know, and, and we see this in so many areas, I think, in relation to women's equality, that it takes women to tell their trauma publicly, um, you know, to influence people. Um, so, you know, it, it was clearly, um, it clearly made an enormous difference because uh, prior to that, people in Ireland really had a number of stereotypes um, and myths really around women who accessed abortions. Um, and then when, when real women were telling their stories, it, it, it really broke, it broke down those myths. You know, there were, there were women with children, there were, you know, um, but, but I do think that that is quite challenging. You know, I, I think so and, and and i definitely feel you know why do women have to do that in order for us to make the advances that we want 
Um, so, so, so it was a strategy, but I think you know one one that one that we all found difficult. I think as well the the other piece for us in Ireland, which has stood us well now in terms of the changes that are happening, was to put abortion very much in the context of women's health care and right to health, and with, within a whole healthcare frame, and and that allowed that if you like it allowed people to come in to supporting abortion who may not have supported it before so what we spoke about was a sort of a comprehensive model of reproductive rights um, and reproductive health care that started with sex education to contraception into um the need for abortion but also to menopause and it was about looking at it in terms of a whole life cycle approach for what was needed for women and it, it let people then come into the conversation much more about abortion because they could see it in a more positive model that, that they could buy into. So that was really important. And I think it stood us really well now as we're campaigning for things like free contraception in Ireland and universal access to contraception. And, 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 and people have, you know, there's ownership of that because it was part of the campaign to, to uh, remove the constitutional ban. So I think, yeah, I think that is some important pieces. And, and I think the final one, which really is standing to us now, was that coalition building and the collaborative approach across civil society, because, you know, we're very much still there in terms of how we want to, um, how we want to reform the legislation and how we want to make it wider. So, so that was an important piece in terms of putting in, you know, the effort and the time well before the, the referendum. Very interesting. Thank you. So the process before the referendum, the official one and the one that you mentioned in terms of coalition building and the painful dimension of having women tell their stories. Uh, yeah. Rebecca, maybe you can add what do you think are successful strategies? What works? What doesn't? Um, so I, I don't know, we are always applying a whole range of strategies and they have different effects in different countries and different situations. So it's hard to have one general comment on that. I think that what we added to the situation in Ireland is that we published research about how many women had used the uh, abortion pills within Ireland. And uh, that was a shock because uh, most of the Irish people thought that women were going abroad. And then suddenly it was thousands of women that actually did abortions in Ireland. So I think that was a very, and so that it was also for the, the health professionals, it was also an argument they could use saying, well, you know, we have to solve this because it's going to continue unless we deal with this within Ireland. That is also what we try in Germany, to be honest, and also in the Netherlands, where we have been, because there is very little research, uh, because it's so hard to find these women that are not be capable of having access. And that is also the research that we're now doing in Ireland. We are continuing to, to gather data about the women in Ireland, for example, that cannot access the services that exist, and we hope it will add to the changes that uh, the possible evaluation of the law. And that is what we've done in our in Germany as well, because women that cannot access the local services, what they do is they go online. And so because they can easily find us, we know who they are. We know why they are not being able to access it. And so we have just the paper about Germany has just been published. It's just uh, public out there. And so I think these data, the local organizations can use these data to advocate for change. Um, uh, of course, the situation in Poland is dif different now as well. I mean, we have uh, we have done a, a ships campaign in Poland already in 2003. And what was interesting there is that that campaign also showed that uh, bef there was by accident there was a public a, a, pub a policy a poll uh, just before the ship campaign and a poll after the ship had been there and they saw an increase of 15 percent of the people that were supporting abortion rights before the campaign and after and so i think that is what these public campaigns do or these protests is what they do is they allow for people that are actually supportive of abortion rights to speak out and not to be marginalized and to break the taboo so i think that any publicity campaign will help doing that. 
um, and, uh, and, and, um, and that is, I think, also the change that we're seeing now in Poland happening again, where with all these actions, with all these protests, um, that people are feel more strengthened in their opinion when they are supportive of abortion rights, instead of that the media, which is controlled usually by the conservative parties and by the conservative groups, they are only addressing abortion in a very negative uh, tone. Um, yeah, so, so I think that anything that brings abortion in the open will help to create change. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and as we had to you the question as well, um, and maybe because you are, you know, it's so acute, maybe you can also relay if there isn't a big internal also maybe discussion on what are the best strategies to take or what are the best objectives uh, to choose. Um, and do you think, you know, that uh, there is clarity on that or, um, yeah, what are sort of, mm -hmm. is there already a joint strategy? Is it still, a, you know, it seems to be that um, uh, because it came from the court judgment, there was an external moment when you sparked the campaign, but you have been campaigning on this for long. Um, mm. So I think it would be interesting to know what kind of different uh, strategies exist and how you have if uh, Corona has changed the strategy, the court decision has changed the strategy um, mm -hmm. and how you take it forward. Yeah, I guess, uh, um, as we already see, there are different strategies which work in different contexts because um, also, you know, like cultural ideas or imaginaries around abortions, uh, abortion differ, and also the sort of political context differs. So I guess what, is, what has happened in Poland is that just as, I mean, abortion has become part of the question of, uh, well, how the democracy works, basically. Because just as in the 90s, um, introducing a ban on abortion was imagined or was presented uh, by the um, post-solidarity political actors as a process of reinstating democracy with its um, gender conservative, with this kind of gender conservative flavor. Uh, right now, it is quite visible that um, opposing uh, these uh, conservative positions has become um, well connected to a broader question of struggles for democracy, struggles for, um, for the participation, uh, struggles for pluralism and uh, conflicts around, you know, the ways in which we imagine uh, the relationship between the state and its citizens. So um, in, in, in a sense, uh, the, I would say that the, Poli, that the what the Polish women's um, um, movement and also with the help with, with other um, activists such as Rebecca, for example, has done during the last, well, almost three years now is to construct a specific set of um, arguments, language, um, tactics to, um, to introduce this issue to, to, to public in public debates right but there have been very little space for those public debates prior to 2016 i would say because the major um, liberal media were not really interested in that and often the persons who had uh, who were basically part of the uh, cultural or political elites even the liberal ones were really um, um, protectors of the so-called compromise of the 1993. So the idea was, well, let's have Polish women um, um, do whatever they need to do in their private sphere and seek abortion in the uh, underground or abroad, uh, while we keep the Catholic Church happy and the ultra-conservative part of the society happy by, um, by having this very restrictive law. And uh, in a way, what has happened in 2016 was the realization um, by the majority of the population that first of all, it was not really a compromise because women had no voice in this process, but also that ultra-conservative uh, groups and religious fundamentalists would not stop until they will introduce a total ban on abortion, uh, contraception, sex education, and so on. So the, um, the, 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 the fact that the law which was um, proposed in 2016 was so cruel in a way, right? Because it was 
it basically uh, if it was in, in implement if it would be implemented that would mean that you know uh, women would basically die because you know uh, the many doctors would be um, afraid to um, help them even in um, uh, very difficult health conditions unless there was a you know immediate danger to women's uh, life for example right so if you construct the law in such restrictive way and if you include in the law up to five years in prison sentence for women undergoing abortion that means that uh, that you really really um, uh, want to punish women basically for uh, having the, the need to have an abortion. So what was uh, what has changed in 2016 was that um, finally we started to talk about women uh, and not fetuses and not the origins of life and so on, uh, but actually act actual life of women and not only women who could imagine themselves to be in need of abortion, but also women who were started to be afraid that if they have um, um, endangered pregnancy of or if they have any type of uh, abnorm fetal abnormalities, they will not be treated as patients, but they will be treated as potential suspects. Right, so this 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 kind of law has been uh, named cruel, uh, barbaric, and so on, for a good reason. Right, so this kind of cruelty of the idea that you can punish women for needing an abortion or for needing any type of uh, reproductive um, uh, health services uh, has become finally a part of a discussion. Right, so in that sense, this refocus of uh, of uh, the discussion on women um, has been key to I think changing the, the views on uh, of, of the majority of people right because once you it, and it shows in opinion polls if you ask you know the question you know whether we should protect the life from the very beginning of course more majority of people will be like mm, yeah why not I mean I'm for life, right? But if you ask people, you know, if women should have um, the right to um, access an uh, abortion, if they need that, right? The, 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 then the question is about women's life choices, conditions, health, and so on. So I think that has been um, um, an, an incredibly important um, um, change in this, but I wouldn't say that it was really a change in strategies of the women's movement, because we have been saying that for a long time, but rather that finally there was this opening in the sort of discursive opportunity structure in which those voices could be finally heard. And of course, um, part of the, uh, we have a discussion in, in Poland, we had a discussion at least, I, I think now it's uh, because of the political polarization and the sort of radicalization of the movement, we, we don't really have it anymore. But there was a discussion around, you know, what kind of language should we use? Should we use this individual individualistic position, which is um, uh, included in the name of our discussion, uh, in the name of our today's discu discussion, the title, sorry, My Body, My Choice. So this kind of, you know, I own my body, therefore I should have the right to decide on it. Should we uh, include much more social justice perspective, right? That actually those women who are most affected are women who are from marginalized communities, whether they are poor, whether they are refugees, whether they are minority women and so on and so forth. So in that sense, um, it is an argument which really shows the hypocrisy of the situation in which you have a um, um, ban, which works only for those who can have those, you know, couple of hundreds uh, of uh, euros or 2000 euros to go to, I don't know, UK. Um, and another um, um, strategic way to position this issue, which I think maybe not so much emerged, but was much more visible after 2016, was to discuss it in terms of, um, well, affective solidarity. Right, like I feel for other women who are in this situation. I feel for women who um, who have to be afraid um, if they, you know, um, have uh, some trouble, you know, some issues with her health issues during their pregnancy, and they are afraid to go to the doctors because the doctor is not um, professional, but he becomes, you know, the the agent of the um, oppressive state. So in that sense, um, it, it is um, very important to, um, to think of that. And I think that the main, um, main issue now is um, how to reconcile um, attempts to destigmatize uh, abortion 
uh, in Poland, for example, groups like um, Abortion Dream Team has been very vocal in talking about abortion as something that is just natural, right? That shouldn't be that we shouldn't be ashamed of. That, um, uh, that the main slogan is "abortion is okay," right? And at the same time, how to reconcile that with the fact that many Polish women uh, are Catholic, right? So they have of an ambiguous position around this issue, right? So how to introduce this, this um, language which normalizes abortion as, um, as an issue of, uh, of uh, basically healthcare provision, and at the same time include in those conversation women who might not be uh, so open to this kind of language, who might be actually against abortion, but who would be also against any um, any laws that would enable women to access abortion, right? So for me, this is a huge issue for the future, especially if, you, if we think about, you know, political developments during the last, during the next couple of years, you know, how to win over, um, especially older women who are the core supporters of the law and justice and who are often very religious and very, well, gender traditional, uh, to include them in this conversation and to, um, and to, you know, to, to, to form this coalition, um, which would include people who say abortion is okay, people who say abortion might not be okay, but it should be offered for women, people who say, personally, it is against my religious views, but I think that the state should have no matter in that, right, and so on and so forth. So this is the, 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 the issue which I think is probably one of the biggest uh, biggest um, challenges for, for in terms of the strategies of the movement. Although, of course, the main challenge is to, to uh, well, to change the, <laughs> the, the, the government, so to speak. And this is what the uh, big protests today uh, are uh, de demand, demanding, right? So they basically demand uh, the end of this unjust um, and very oppressive um, rule of the law and justice. Thank you. Can I ask a question to Elspieta? Yeah. Or is that not a moment yet? Oh, we don't hear you. Francesca? Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I have questions lining up, but go ahead, please. Can I ask you something? Because for me, what was interesting about Poland, the experiences that in Poland, is that when we went to the vote in 2003, we could not find one doctor who was willing to publicly speak out for abortion rights. And we know at that time there were, and still there's a lot of doctors that are performing underground abortions after office hours, right? It's also a model where, you know, it, it, some doctors do it for an extra income, but we couldn't find any doctor that was willing to say, I am supportive of abortion rights. And I was wondering, has this changed now? Are there more doctors that are vocally supporting abortion rights? And not only in the exceptional cases for fetal abnormalities, but also for women on request. Uh, because I agree with, with, with Orla that in a sense, when you, when, you, when you frame this as a healthcare issue, uh, for many people, it is something that is not about their religion. It's not about um, their personal views, but it's something about uh, yeah, about healthcare, and and it's easier for them to accept it, and especially when you have like some high-profile older guy doctors, <laughs> mm. willing to you know that have the uh, the uh, uh, that are trusted by the public when they say, well, this is very important for the health of a woman that she has this. Yeah. That's what all um, I said also on Ireland. So it would yeah. be interesting to see. Yeah. Uh, How is the situation now in uh, in uh, in uh, in Poland. in Poland today. Yeah. I would say it's changing, but very, very slowly. So it's much easier to, um, it, it has become much easier to, for example, have doctors to speak about uh, how horrible um, and uh, barbarian is the idea to um, uh, to introduce ban on abortion in, in cases of a fetal abnormality, but you wouldn't have the same doctors talking openly about the fact that women should have access to abortion whenever they need abortion right yeah. so in that sense there have been um attempts to um to address uh, medical professionals by the women's movement there has been initiatives such as um doctors for women uh, which which are initiated by by um well feminist doctors basically 
uh, mostly female doctors, of course. Yeah. But I would say that the majority of the uh, of the um, uh, of the uh, of doctors are very cautious to have any type of uh, you know public opinion on that and especially you know if you look at who is speaking openly about abortions usually these are doctors who work uh, abroad like you know in german clinics for example polish doctors who work in german clinics so well, in that sense <laughs> yeah so in that sense it's incredibly difficult to uh, to really have support of the polish uh, doctors and nurses Thank you, Elspieta. Um, I was saying that I think it's interesting that you have in Poland right now this linkage between this issue of women's rights and the question of uh, democracy as such, the independence of uh, the judiciary and that it, these struggles have joined up. Um, and uh, Rebecca, you were asked if you could share the link to the study on Germany in the chat, maybe. I think I, think that I already did. If you could share, um, probably it's online. So if you could share no, the link, I, I no, did. I did it in the questions. Where do I do it in the chat? Or oh, in the chat? I can do it in the chat as well. In yeah. the chat, I think because not everybody's looking into Q and A. So if you could also add it there. Um, and there's a question also to you, Rebecca, um, which I think is in interesting because it relates to the German debate we're having. Because in order to have abortions, you need medical staff that is actually trained on it. Yeah. And uh, so the question is who who trains them and is it part of the curriculum? Um, and uh, it is quite an interesting debate that we're having in Germany on in terms of you know how how, how normal is it in the curriculum does everybody has to learn it and then how do you uh, uh, ensure that you have medical staff spread across the country? So maybe Rebecca, you can give some insights on that. Um, and then I have a question for Ola. So I think it's a problem in general in many countries. Um, and that is also because usually when there is some training, it's only for gynecologists and a lot of, and because the gynecologists, there are much fewer doctors than general practitioners, for example. And that's what you see in Italy where 70% uh, of the gynecologists refuse to provide, to provide abortion services because of conscientious objections. So that is why you should never ever limit abortion services to a specialist group. Uh, and also because the World Health Organization actually states that nurses, midwives, but also pharmacies uh, can do abortions and women can do abortions themselves actually when they have the proper information which is the self-care model, which is also supported by the World Health Organization now. Um, so, uh, the, so the question is, are we as doctors also willing to let go of the power over the, that we have over the access to the medicines, which is now the case. Uh, and I think if we wanna have real equal access, uh, also doctors have to let go of that, which they did with many other medical uh, treatments or interventions, which is delegated to nurses, midwives, or other trained healthcare professionals. It can be an assistant or a pharmacy or, you know, the, um, so the doctor's training is part of that. But on the other hand, it also uh, centrates again, the power with the doctors. Uh, and, I, I, and I think that if we really want to have a far looking strategy, that is not what we should do. That is the reality still in most countries where only doctors are allowed to do medical treatments in general. They're the only ones that are allowed to prescribe medicines, for example. And, and now the way Mifepristone and Mysepristone are regulated, which are the abortion pills, uh, it can only be got, you know, it's not even in a pharmacy, it's only in clinics. Um, I think that uh, the training, of course, now I'm talking mostly about medical abortions because that is something that can be accessible in such a low, so, so easily accessible. That is, of course, different when you talk about surgical procedures and especially when you talk about second trimester abortions, uh, which are also the ones that are usually done for the um, genetical malformations, which are usually after the 12 weeks. These are much more complicated medical procedures and doctors really have to be trained properly for that. But even these are usually done with medicines in countries like in Sweden and in Norway, also almost all the- Is there any country in the EU that allows midwives, for example, uh, yeah. to do that? Yeah. Really? Which France is allowing midwives to do medical abortions and Sweden. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and so, um, what did I want to say? Sorry, I'm off my point. But of course, when you talk about the later abortions, even though they can be done with medicines, most of these are still being done under closed medical supervision because when there's a complication, you need to know the surgical techniques in order to evacuate the womb uh, mm -hmm. properly. Um, and, and that is the training that now is only being given to uh, gynecologists. But also there, there has been a shift. Before, a lot of the general practitioners used to, do, to also give birth, help uh, uh, giving birth to women. And there's now very few general practitioners that still do that because it has been, it has been um, that has been taken over that control by, uh, um, by gynecologists or of course midwives, most midwives. Well, in the Netherlands, it's midwife. You don't have midwives everywhere in the world. So it's a question about power of medical institutions and training, not only training. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I have a question to you, Ola, um, but anybody else who might want to jump in, Rebecca, or is better, you're welcome. It's a question about, is it easier to legalize same-sex marriage uh, than having a liberalized abortion law? Uh, and if so, why? And what are some parallels that you see? Mm. It was a question from the, from the audience. Yeah. And I think it's quite interesting to ask. So maybe you want to chip in some yeah. information on that. And it, it was certainly a real, um, I suppose, you know, central uh, debating point in Ireland, our conversation point in terms of after the success of the marriage equality referendum, um, you know, people were immediately asking that, well, now, you know, now we have marriage equality, it should be easy to, re to repeal the eighth. And, you know, we knew that wasn't the case as women's organizations, but there were certainly, I mean, it, there was a lot of learnings from the from civil society organization about things that worked in that marriage equality referendum campaign. Um, and a lot of the people who were involved in the marriage equality campaign at a, a leadership level, like uh, my other co-director, uh, co Alva Smith, was one of the leaders um, in the marriage equality campaign. So, the, so we learned a lot from that referendum in terms of how to bring a whole public conversation on an issue that we knew was controversial or difficult. Um, but it was always different because in, in for marriage equality, it was talking to the values of marriage and you know it was interesting listening to Elizabeth in, in terms of the whole piece around Catholicism in Poland and you know so we had we had that experience in Ireland and although it was much weakened you know in the marriage equality campaign you were talking the values of marriage and about an institution that Irish people identified with so that was quite different in terms of talking about abortion where the majority of the population were very uncomfortable about talking about it and didn't really want to talk about it and didn't want to admit that it was happening in, in the country. So there were enormous differences and we knew it would be uh, a, a much more challenging and difficult campaign in a way than marriage equality. But we were in a really good place because we had learned so much, I think, from that campaign. So things like, I mean, the you know, the storytelling that I mentioned was such an important feature of marriage equality and one that we learned from. And, and I mean, the point that Rebecca made earlier about, you know, the evidence, the facts, that that, that was so important in, in terms of marriage equality around breaking down the myths and was so important in the abortion referendum as well. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, yeah, they were very, they were very different campaigns, but um, but also, I mean, I think both of them really showed and chose that Irish society had really shifted. And in both of them, and, and I think we, we tried to speak to those values because there was definitely, and still is in Ireland, a sense of wanting to move away from a past and particularly around women. And this was something that really, you know, was very clear in the abortion campaign, but that the way Irish society and particularly as a result of Catholicism had treated women, you know, whether it was locking them up in um, the Magdalene laundries, which is, you know, a big feature in our society for women, women who were lone parents and, and how they were treated. And also then because of the whole scandals and, and around sexual abuse and, and child abuse that had come, you know, as a result of religious institutions, that there's, there's a strong sense in Ireland about wanting to move away from that and, and seeing that as being in the past. And, 
And we spoke to those values in, in the abortion campaign in terms of, you know, being, being a more modern country and being a country that was compassionate. And we used compassion as one of the values in the campaign. We care, compassion, change were the three sort of, you know, pillars, if you like, of the campaign. So it was, it was speaking to that, which was really important. Francesca, there's one thing, just because I thought it was important in terms of what um, things that Elizabeth and Rebecca were saying, one of the things I think that made an enormous difference in Ireland, particularly for the women, you know, that we were talking about in terms of maybe who might have been, you know, um, you know, who would ascribe to Catholicism, who would have been more conservative, was the piece that you were saying earlier, Rebecca, around putting across the fact that a constitution or a legislative ban on abortion doesn't prevent abortions. All they do is cause harm to women. So it, it never stops it. And that was actually really important in terms of that, you know, people understanding that. that so, so, so if you want to reduce abortions, you look to things like contraception and sex education, but it's not about constitutional bans. And, and that, that made a big difference in, in terms of some of the thinking from the, from the more conservative, um, certainly, you know, more conservative women in, in, in our society. Very interesting to say, if you like it or not, it happens, but make it safe uh, as an okay. argument. Um, yeah. And I think that's a bit what Elspieta was also trying to refer to in terms of even if you would rule it out for yourself, but maybe mm. you can have compassion that it shouldn't be uh, unsafe. Um, yeah. Uh, and I have maybe uh, Rebecca or Elspieta, you want to come in, in on that parallel question. There's also one which I think is interesting, a question on um, why do you think is there so much opposition to women's rights uh, when it comes to abortion and sexual rights? Why do you think there are so many obstacles and hurdles? Why is the fight so hard? Rebecca, Elspieta, I don't know if um, any of you want to come in on either of these two questions. Elspieta, I see. Yes. Yes, I think Elspieta is probably the better one to answer it because I think it's really actually a uh a very much a, theolo a theoretical question that she researched a lot and 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 i find that there's so many theories that you can refer to and i don't have the the proper language for that so as better you go <laughs> yes i i guess it's it's very much about you know how power shifts within society and i really like the ways in which some sociologists look at it such as mira marx free for example who looks at the question of reproduction as the question of power balance. And um, in that sense, the fact that women would get access to abortion, access to contraception, access to sex education and so on, means that uh, men would actually lose this uh, control, which they had for a long time over um, process of reproduction and basically women's bodies as well. So in that sense, if you think about um, the motivation of religious um, uh, institutions, for example, I would say it, they are as much theolo theological as, as much as concerned with the type of power um, specific institutions and, and uh, the state can have over women. Uh, if, um, the, if the state regulates um, these issues very restrictively. But I think that in the last couple of years, um, I have been um, studying the anti-gender campaigns. So the campaigns uh, which are growing in visibility and power around the world. Um, and you, could, you can see very clearly that there has been um, organizations um, which were basically opposing uh, the, the very concept of gender, the very concept of, of uh, you know, for example, um, uh, the fact that we are not probably, you know, like binary in terms of there are just men and women, but, you know, gender can be described as a more flexible or fluent concept that has many different adaptations or variations, right? Um, but in that sense, you can see that, of course, this uh, opposition to the very concept of gender and, you know, women's rights and women's reproductive rights and minority rights has its roots, um, well, very long roots, but let's say let let's just focus on the on the most important now, the cultural wars in U.S. in the nineties and in in the sixties um, uh, uh, and seventies, which uh, if you look the, for example at the reports, I think Open Democracy has published recently a report showing 
that um, ultra-conservative, usually Protestant organizations from the US has poured over uh, you know, tens of millions of dollars during the last couple of years to lobby for ultra-conservative causes on the EU level. On the other hand, you have um, organizations which are financed by Russia, by, uh, by Brazil, by uh, Mexico. So people from around the world um, uh, are a, well willing to finance this kind of um, uh, endeavors. And at the same time, this is a political game today, much more uh, than um, you know, a discussion about you know, morality or not. Because uh, right-wing populists uh, around the world and right-wing uh, extreme parties has taken on this uh, conservative views on gender um, um, for the last couple of years um, in an increasingly, in a more visible fashion, I would say. And you can see that this opportunistic synergy between ultra conservatives and right wing populists is um, is politically effective in many cases. So it gives the right wing populists this kind of notion of the moral divide between us and them, between the elites and the people. It gives them a sense of moral crusade and also um, often allows to sanitize the ultra the uh, extreme right uh, ideas, uh, which are basically racist ideas or anti Semitic ideas, to dress them up as the support for traditional families and protection of children. And at the same time, you can see see how ultra-conservative organizations are growing in power because of the support of, um, of, um, of the state, basically. In Poland, for example, you can see Ordo Juris Institute, one of the key organizations behind um, those anti-gender campaigns, one of the key organizations behind the 2016 ban on abortion proposal, uh, which has become uh, one of the major think tanks supporting uh, the current government. People from these organizations are uh, increasingly included in key state institutions, including also the constitutional tribunal. Uh, there is a quite uh, wide tendency for elite change in which the liberal elites are supposedly uh, you know, corrupt and immoral and so on. And that's why they need to be replaced by gender conservative local um, nationalist oriented groups. So in that sense, this is a political game today. And if you look at people such as um, Trump and Salvini, two, two people who luckily are no longer in power uh, in the US and, and Italy, you could see this kind of the, the situation in which they um, gradually adopted the, this ultra conservative agenda. Right. So Salvini was not always this kind of kiss crossing supporter of the family, traditional family issues. Right. He has adopted this position uh, because of the uh, support of ultra conservative organizations that came with it because it gave him, him access to, you know, networks and political support. So in that sense, um, it is really uh, worth to look at those conflicts today, not so much as part of um, well, the crash of postmodern and let's say pre-modern sensibilities, but more as a as a political game, in which the question of minority rights, human rights, and so on, so on, are included in uh, in political parties' agenda to uh, to uh, for example um, create scapegoats to deepen polarization political polarization and social polarization to sanitize their uh, their ultra uh, extreme right positions so that I think should be really included in our strategies and the ways in which we think about those conflicts there is a question back to you um, uh, more precise, um, in terms of the reproductive uh, justice uh, framing or narrative, which has been strong in the US, uh, especially used by women of color, uh, if that would be something that could be used in the Polish context or more in the European context. I think Ola, you spoke about, and you also, Rebecca, about the justice dimension. Um, maybe, Elzbieta, it was precisely asked to you uh, if that is also the case in a Polish context, uh, and if you could give more precise examples of um, how the link, how the narratives of anti-abortion and racist do join up. Well, uh, 
the, the, the link is often uh, not very explicit, but you could look, for example, at the, at the discussion around 2015 when the so-called refugee crisis has happened. So the narrative is around the fact that, uh, well, to put it bluntly, um, the ultra-conservative forces claim that Polish, uh, you know, feminist and gender elites want to introduce abortions in order to um, to depopulate Poland and at the same time opening gates for for um, uh, for mass migration in order to create this kind of um, well. Um, uh, mishmash of a society that would have no cultural um, traditions, no, uh, no, and, and therefore no ability to oppose the sort of control of, of the state and global corporations. So this is a kind of, in a nutshell, right, the idea that, uh, that um, the sort of links the population with uh, with um, abortion and uh, with a sort of global power dynamic. And of course, the idea that Poland has been in fact colonized by the West culturally plays an important um, role here. But it's quite interesting to see at, uh, how it plays in other contexts, such as if you read, for example, Gabriel Kubi, a German uh, sociologist who is very uh, vocal, um, in the anti-gender circles, and she has been her, her works has been uh, translated into many languages. She uses this uh, this connection between racism and uh, and reproductive rights to accuse actually uh, Western elites of imposing um, reproductive um, uh, re reproductive um, health uh, care on, for example, African countries in order to depopulate them, right? So it's, it's really interesting how this anti-colonial frame works differently in Poland, for example, and in um, um, Germany or, or uh, France. So the idea is that in Poland, we are the ones who are colonized. So basically they want to uh, create a, a mold of, of people who will be manipulable and easily um, influenced through the population and through introduction of of um, people from other countries, of course, uh, uh, people who are brown and black are, are seen his, as, here as the main danger. And at the same time, this, uh, this uh, um, argument is being used to accuse uh, liberal elites in Western countries of being actu actually racist and, um, and being the colonizers, right? So the idea is shame on you, you have been implementing or Im imposing those foreign values on colonized people in countries in Africa or Asia. So this is a very flexible um, frame which has been used in different countries in different ways. Thank you very much. Can um, I add something to this? Please, go ahead. I think that if you look at successful campaigns around women's rights, it has always been the campaigns where the women was the victim. Uh, and, um, and, and so, and I, I think that is also something which you see in the abortion uh, debate where the, 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 there is more understanding for abortion rights when, for example, the woman is the victim when she was raped or where she's been, the, when there was domestic abuse and things like that. And I, and I, and I think that is, that is one of the things that is really difficult to, to address where in a sense, abortion is a very can be a very empowering decision because women are taking charge of their own lives. That they are taking a different way than you know, yeah, they're taking charge. So they they are empowered. It's an empowered decision, even though it might not always be what they choose or would want to in the first instances. And so it's it's that is that is um, very much in in almost in, in contrary to how society wants to fight for causes where people are victims. They feel that they want to protect people and that's only when people are victims. Um, so, yeah. So I think that the social, the social justice perspective is something I think that is very good for more internal communications, but might be much less effective when you're talking about public um, a public campaign. I don't know how the others think about that. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, Ola, maybe you want to add to that. Um, and I would give you uh, one more question from myself, which I have to the three of you. Uh, talking about Europe and the European Union, uh, did it help you in some way in your campaign, Ola, uh, the European framework or the European support? And what else do you expect from Europe? Yeah, and I, th I think when I was answering, you know, that piece about maybe some of the lessons in terms of the strategies, because it is one of the pieces that I didn't mention, and that was the whole international pressure um, that, you know, that came on Ireland from a number of different places. And one of those was about the legal cases that were taken to both, you know, courts of human rights um, with regard to, so when uh, couples have to travel and that was around fatal fetal anomalies, you know, so there were cases taken, taken um, and very clearly uh, those cases were saying that the experiences of women and of couples was degrading, it was inhumane um, and it was an infringement of their rights and that, um, that brought real attention in, in a way that, that the Irish government you know, didn't want and were embarrassed on, on the international I suppose, arena. Um, so so that they were really important uh, and they, they had to pay compensation in terms of those cases. Um, so so I, I, I think that was key and it, it, it wasn't only about the case, but obviously the cases then allowed, you know, enabled us in Ireland to, to you know, to really um, to use them in terms of, you know, bringing more attention to the fact that, you know, what we were asking women um, to endure was what was inhumane and, and an infringement of their rights. So I think that the, the legal cases was key, but also in terms of, you know, one of the things about the, the campaign and was the um, Irish Irish people and support from, from women in other countries. So, you know, there, there were a number of groups set up in other countries who, who supported repeal in Ireland. Um, and that helped in terms of the sort of online campaigns that happened. So, so that international solidarity piece, I think is really important. And I know that women's organizations in Ireland, um, ourselves and other abortion organizations really want to be able to do that in terms of Poland as well, and are involved in that in, uh, um, ar around some of the social media campaigns. But, uh, but I think it's, it's, it was key. And there were also pieces as well that happened in terms of protests outside of embassies, Irish embassies in different countries. And that was really important as well. So, so yeah, I, I think the international piece, I mean, in terms of at a European stage, because health isn't a clear competency within the EU, that, you know, obviously there is, I suppose, a weakness there in, 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 in terms of um, what can be done. But there's certainly, I, you know, we would say that, that there's a lot of potential and opportunity there. Um, and you can see that in some aspects of, of how the parliament works. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that is, you know, that's really important. And just to maybe go back to, you know, your original piece about the framing, about the repro uh, reproductive justice framing, um, you know, I think now, well, now for us in Ireland, I suppose, because we're out of that sort of referendum mode and we're into a much more, you know, long-term embedded campaign in terms of how we advance um, abortion provision in Ireland, uh, that, that framing around reproductive justice, I think, has has a lot to offer in terms of women's rights, um, and it still, I think, can can sit alongside the, the whole sort of comprehensive healthcare model. Um, so yeah, and I, I think, which it, I like, it does go back to, to that sort of question around, you know, why is there such, um, why can there be such a fierce opposition to um, to abortion and women's reproductive rights. And it is because it goes to the heart of women's equality. I mean, really goes to the core in terms of women being able to control their own bodies and control their own fertility. And that is, you know, it's so essential. And that's why, I, you know, I certainly think that the reprodu reproductive justice framing, you know, sits well, with, I suppose, with the rationale for, for, for why women's, women's organizations say that reproductive rights are so important. And you know, and, and 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 is at the core. So yeah, and I mean, I I do think actually in terms of these conversations and also some that we're having in Ireland is, is talking that out that out more because you know we're not experiencing right now a backlash in Ireland in, in terms of you know what's been happening. 
Um, but that doesn't mean it won't happen. And what we are seeing is an emergence, absolutely, of the far right in terms of attacking, particularly, um, to, particularly on the issues of race. And, and we've seen it as well in terms of COVID and public health messaging. So it's something we're very alert to in terms of how, how the issue of abortion and reproductive rights can also become very quickly part of that narrative and something that we need to be much more organised about. And I mean, in fact, there's just been the start of a new coalition in Ireland. It's called Lakeila. Lakeila is an Irish, uh, an Irish language word, Gaelic word for together. Um, and it's diversity, um, it's for diversity and not division, but it's in opposition to the rise of the far right in Ireland and women's organizations are at the heart of that because you know I suppose because we we want to prevent some of the things that we're seeing in, in other uh, countries across Europe. Great thank you that's good news to have that um, coalition and to be vigilant I would say uh, and prepared. Uh, Rebecca maybe you want to add uh, in terms of EU European and I mentioned what you would ask for. What say for? Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, of course, it is at the heart. Um, the uh, just justice is what what is what is at the heart of it because it's everywhere, wherever you live, whether it's in a country where it's legal or illegal. When you have money, when you have means, when you have access to information, you will always be able to get your abortion. Uh, whether you have to travel for it or whether you, you know, can pay a doctor for an underground abortion. Um, so it, it fundamentally, it's all about social justice. That's it. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, Elspeta, maybe for your final word, something also what you hope or look forward from Europe to get. Do you get enough? European support or could you need some more uh, and in what kind of way what kind of support would help some support might not be helpful it would be interesting to hear what you think uh, would work in the Polish framework what kind of support. Well, I think that uh, we, we really need support both in terms of, you know, um, having a sense of Europe, not abandoning the hopeless, um, you know, unruly Never. Poland, um, but also a, a sense of supporting organizations. And of course, this is really problematic within the sort of, you know, financial um, framework uh, of the European Union in connection to civil society in different countries. So that, that's one of the things that we might need to work on much more. Uh, but also, I think what is really important to have um, those transnational discussions and to really understand that what we are um, against, um, the, the, what we are really facing is, uh, is a coalition of different, uh, of different um, uh, groups, organizations, politicians, political parties, which are often in, uh, often work in cooperation, offer, often share know-how, often work on the level of the European Union and so on. So in that sense, I think we really need much more coordination and cooperation to, uh, to understand how this functions in different countries and, you know, to, to understand that what is happening in Poland is not, um, is not uh, so much, uh, you know, just, you know, country specific because, you know, Poland has a Catholic church and is a gender conservative country, but rather that those groups and organizations find um, political op opportunities, in, opportunities in Poland, which are much better than in other countries, but in fact, they are active elsewhere as well. So I think that this realization and this kind of cooperation and this kind of you know sharing um, knowledge on what is happening and sharing know-how and sharing strategies among us is um, something that uh, we need really uh, quickly and in a sort of broader. Um, um, we have to be much better at that, basically, right? So, uh, and I, I also think that I just read the outcomes of the new opinion poll, which uh, says that 70% uh, of polls are of the opinion that linking uh, the question of the rule of law in Poland to budgetary uh, decisions uh, is right. So in a way, it's, it's quite Im Im impressive to see that uh, the huge amount of anti-EU propaganda, which has been pouring 
um, from uh, state-owned TV and state of uh, state-owned media and ruling party um, have very limited influence on what people think. You know, so I guess uh, we, it would be really great to find much more effective ways in which we can communicate or, you know, um, the people who are uh, representing the European Union institutions to communicate directly with the Polish people, right, to have this connection, to have a sense that it's not just um, some distant um, uh, group of people in Brussels, but this is actually something that has to do with the ways in which in which we live, that you know, with our needs, which our with our rights, and so on and so forth. So this kind of direct contact and direct communication is something that I think we, we need to think much more about. Can I add something? I'm so sorry that I because I was not answering properly to your question. I think there's one problem within the EU, and that is the Treaty of Maastricht which is excluding abortion rights or abortion from all the negotiations that are taking place on any other issues. That has to be renegotiated re by all the countries, that it, there should not be a space for that anymore, for this ex, uh, ex, uh, exceptional uh, exception within the European, uh, Europe about abortion, because it also means that any European Court of Human Rights decision, uh, they will always refer to this Treaty of Maastricht saying, well, but countries can decide for, this, for themselves. In Europe, fundamental human rights have to be protected and guaranteed. And there should not be an exception. And I think that as long as the European states are not going to be standing squarely for that, uh, countries like Poland and Hungary and Malta will do the fuck what they want uh, concerning abortions. Um, and they, there, there won't be enough, uh, you know, there won't be enough tools to actually demand that they respect uh, women's rights. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> Um, now it's important that you pointed out again that the European treaties uh, uh, explicitly do exempt that issue. Um, uh, that, by the way, was supported at the time also by the German government. So it, it was a much broader coalition supporting it um, than it may seem. Uh, but I think, Elspeth, what you said is very important about the pull of uh, linking also EU funding to the rule of law. Um, because we as Greens always argue that the funding should not be taken away from the country, just from the government that is ruling, and that the funding should go to communities, to cities, to civil society organizations that do, um, you know, stand on the grounds of uh, democracy and the rule of law. It was always important for us to say it's not against the Polish people. It's not, you know, it's about taking away the power of the government that is destroying the, the independence of the judiciary to decide about who gets the funding. Um, and I think we, we still have work to do to get that point across in Poland, in Hungary, in other countries, um, that we're not against the citizens of that country. But I think what you all said is that we have much already gained, but much to defend as well, and much still to be achieved. Uh, and that we have to gain much from exchanging and sharing experiences and being in solidarity. Uh, and I'm very grateful to the Heinrich Bill Foundation and for the Foundation uh, Women in Europe uh, for allowing us to come together here tonight. It was supposed to be in person, but you know, as everything else, we're digital, but I still think uh, that this was a very rich um, and informative discussion. And uh, I hope we can continue on this. Uh, as Mark Bertolt said, it's the start of, of a series of events. Uh, so hopefully we can continue this discussion and bring in more voices and maybe one day meet again in person uh, and have the personal support. But I hope um, that you feel it. And uh, you know, if it wasn't for Corona, many of us would be in Poland and be on your, next to you uh, in the streets, really. Um, I would be there and I think many others as well. Um, but please feel our support and I'm very, you know, impressed and uh, yeah, uh, also grateful for all of you that are standing up. Uh, and thanks for Rebecca and thanks for sharing that report with us. Uh, we know we are not yet, you know, we still have many fights in Germany too. Uh, maybe they came a bit short today, but you know we brought many of the issues you touched actually also do concern Germany, especially when it comes to who has access, uh, rural city areas. As Ola said, it's a big issue in Germany. Uh, how do you have access? 
um, who is trained, who has the right to, to do abortions, etc. So in a way, it touched on the questions, the German questions as well. I think they're really European and international ones. Um, so let me thank you very much. And thanks to all the great questions we got. I think they were very useful questions from the audience. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks to the team of the Bull Foundation for organizing this uh, and Women in Europe, the foundation to allow this financially. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, great. Bye bye.